My name is Noreen Chagru, and I'm with Women and Gender and Global Perspectives. And on behalf of the Center for Advanced Study, I would like to welcome you to the Center's Forum on Critical Issues. Before we begin this afternoon, there's a Miller Com, which is sponsored by the Center for Advanced Studies, that is relevant to this topic. It's coming up on Thursday, February 23rd, and it is Susan Forbes Martin and she is the Executive Director of the Institute for the Study of International Migration at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at George Washington University. And she'll be talking on criminal trafficking and slavery, um, and that is something that some of you might find of interest, and it is also uh, a center event. Um, I'm also pleased to announce that the Center for Advanced Study has decided that it's 2000 eight campus-wide interdisciplinary initiative, of which they do one every year, that one will focus on immigration. And the center has named prof professors Jim Barrett from the History Department and Gail Summerfield from Women and Gender and Global Perspectives as the co-director of that initiative. Now we'd like to turn to today's forum on immigration. One of the questions that's been raised is why would the Center for Advanced Study conduct a forum on immigration? And the answer is, is because immigration is one of the most contentious issues in America today. We're a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation divided over immigrants and immigration policies. Concerns about jobs, culture, a way of life, and economic stability all frame or cloud public and private discussions of how we as a nation should best accommodate or not the growing numbers of immigrants living and working in our communities. Immigration has once again moved to the front of the domestic policy agenda. And there are a number of legislative initiatives aimed at reforming our system. For those of you who have not picked one up on the tables, there is a short summary of the most recent House bill uh, under consideration, and Dorothy Schneider, one of our panelists, put that together. Um, immigration brings new labor and new ideas to a nation, but it also brings challenges to existing political, religious, cultural, and economic institutions. Because of this, today we are asking what immigration policies make the most sense for the United States. In order to address this, this issue, we've brought together a group of experts from our campus. And before I introduce them, I need to go through the way today's forum is going to work. What will happen is, is I've written some questions that I'm going to put before the panel. And the panel, we've had some meetings and discussions, and the, the questions arose from their expertise. And they will answer the questions, and it'll be a dialogue among the panel. What we would like all of you to do is, when you've got a question, go to one of the two microphones, and we'll, we will uh, integrate you into the discussion. What we're really trying to do is have a dialogue with the audience and the panel, as well as a dialogue amongst the panel members themselves. Um, let me start by introducing Professor Alejandro Lugo from the Department of Anthropology and the Latino Latino Studies Program. His research and teaching focuses on ethnicity and race in U.S. border life and on U.S. border life and activities at the border. He also studies gender in Latin America. His published work on border life and activities focused primarily on the U.S.-Mexican border. And I want to thank Professor Lugo for joining us today. Next is Professor Ilana Redstone Akrish from the Department of Sociology. She is both a sociologist and a demographer, and her research focus is immigration, incorporation, and assimilation. She is concerned with occupational mobility, earnings assimilation, and health outcomes. One of the things that's most interesting about her work compared to some of the other panelists is she primarily focuses on documented workers, whereas other people on the panel will be talking about both the documented and undocumented, so there's a nice contrast there. And we want to thank you very much for joining us today. Next is Augusto Espiritu, a professor in the History Department and in the Asian American Studies Program. His work centers on transnationalism and migration 
as well as the cultural and intellectual life of immigrants. He is the author of a book called Five Faces of Exile, The Nation and Filipino Intellectuals. He is the co-editor of a book about the life of Philip Vera Cruz, the former vice president of the United Farm Workers. Thank you for also being here. Next is Professor, wait a minute, I'm lost here. <laughs> um, next is, is Dorothy Schneider, a historian from the Department of, Hi of Sociology. She is also the coordinator of the Migration Studies Group on campus. She specializes in the history of immigration and naturalization, and her current project is a book about the history of border crossings in the 20th century. Thank you very much for joining us. And next is Professor Hadi Hadi es Esfahani. And Professor es Esfahani is in the Department of Eco Economics, and his theoretical and empirical research <coughs> centers on the political economy of fiscal and regulatory policies. He's our token economist for the afternoon. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is start this panel by asking the panelists, as well as the audience, to address what we think of as a very simple question. Is immigration a problem in the United States? Dorothy, why don't we start with you? Um, and can you speak into the mics because this is being webcast. Immigration brings uh, social and political change to any society. And political change, especially to politicians, but any fundamental change is um, painful or at least um, somewhat unsettling process. In a society like ours where um, a lot of change is negotiated in public, the pain is also felt very much in public and we have a sort of, sort of collective indigestion at this point about, uh, about social change brought about by forces which most of us feel we aren't part of except those of us, of course, who are immigrants themselves, as is, seems the majority of the panelists today. I would say that um, large-scale immigration uh, is a problem in that it brings about change, but no more than that. I do not think that uh, there is a specific um, issue with um, the, a question of the nation state, for example, um, with today's immigration. What is a problem is a um, question that a number of politicians have about their legitimacy in light of a malfunctioning control system that they perceive very massively. And um, secondly, and I think that is um, more uh, real, a misallocation of resources that is uh, very much a problem for a lot of areas heavily impacted by immigration today. And that, uh, at this point, I want to uh, stop and let you ask more panelists or move to another question because that goes into a number of other issues. I think, what I, I think it would be nice if um, Alana and Hadi could jump in, both as someone who studies immigration of documented workers as well as an economist who looks at this with a very different lens than the rest of the panelists to address that. And then I think it would be good to turn to the social scientists and their evaluation of the question. Okay. Um, the I mic. Think, oh, sorry. So is when you ask is immigration a problem, I think that rather than sort of providing an answer to that question, I think what it does is bring up a lot of, I think it's tied in with a lot of other issues and a lot of other questions. Um, and a couple of those, the, the, the few that probably first jumped to mind, first is sort of this idea of what's the goal of our immigration policy. And I don't think that this is something that's been consistent, you know, even over, even over say, the 20th century. But if you think about what the, goal of the, what the goal of U.S. immigration policy is in terms of the laws that we set and who we admit and who we don't admit, um, is the goal to benefit the native-born U.S. population or is the goal to benefit the immigrants themselves? And these how you feel about the answer to those questions is probably going to shape a lot of how you feel about whether or not you think immigration is a problem. Um, and, and I also think that these two questions are the focus or lack of focus in this country about sort of what the goal of immigration policy is supposed to be is tied in with a lot of the controversy, 
a lot of the controversy um, that people feel about immigration. So I guess that's part of it. And then the second part that I would say is just sort of noting that the general trends about how people feel about immigration, um, this may be familiar with some people, but historically it's, it's been quite tied to economic conditions and the amount of attention that it gets um, and the sort of you know, barometer about how the American public feels about it, you know, if the economy is gener generally, if the economy is doing well, people are less concerned about immigration. When the economy is doing poorly, it becomes more of a concern in the forefront of people's minds. So those two things are also tied up. Um, you know, I was just looking, just for the purposes of this panel, I was just looking at one of the, one of the only surveys that I know of that actually asks questions about, you know, how people feel about immigration and whether they feel it should be increased or decreased or is it a good thing, is it a bad thing, is the general social survey. And so I was just looking at the most recent year that they asked questions about um, immigration was 1998. But just sort of, even just a brief look at that, you know, which was what, I guess, so that's eight years ago now, but it's not exactly distant history. Um, there was a 55% of the respondents, and this is a nationally representative sample, 55% of respondents said that they felt immigration should be decreased from its current levels. And of those 50, so it's 55% and 30% um, said that it should be decreased a lot. So they could answer sort of in degrees, should it be decreased a little, decreased a lot. So I mean, there's still a very strong sentiment against immigration in this country, but I do think that it's important to realize that it's tied up with these other issues. Uh, thank you, and uh, I just want to follow up on the observations made earlier. Uh, there, there are a lot of problems, uh, social problems, etc., and uh, but the discussion is focused on economics. So, uh, and being an economist, I want to comment on that a little bit. Uh, do I think about uh, immigration as a problem? Uh, in fact, I've always thought about immigration as an opportunity rather than. A, uh, problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> at least, uh, as far as I was concerned, it was an opportunity. <laughs> and and uh, from an e economics perspective, it is an opportunity if you think about the employers who are interested in employing the immigrants and the workers on the other side of the border who are very much willing to uh, come here. Uh, that's the economic side of it. Of course, you know, there are also people who immigrate here for non-economic reasons. And again, the same thing. There are opportunities here, and there are people who need these opportunities, and matching them uh, would benefit, can in principle benefit everyone. I think where the problem comes in is the way we manage that process uh, that creates uh, insecurities, uncertainties, and difficulties. And uh, the current debate is actually focused there. Uh, let me just uh, point out that the way I, I see things, this is not going to be an easy problem to solve because there is really no uh, pure and simple solution to this problem, but we will discuss that in more detail later on. Okay. How about if we turn this over to the social scientist? <laughs> <coughs> okay, okay I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Um, is immigration a problem? you know, in relation to what, right? Um, I am an ethnographer, an anthropologist, who studies everyday life at the border. Um, I've been uh, tracking, um, in many ways, uh, border crossing, border inspections, particularly at the, at the El Paso, Ciudad Juarez border region. Um, and uh, so I do, I would like to kind of address this question that has been posed to me in relation to everyday life in the U.S. Uh, and everyday life as it relates to uh, the moment, uh, the um, global moment that we are experiencing, uh, the political moment that uh, I think characterizes uh, immigration in itself. And um, since I do care a lot about what people around the country are imagining when they hear that uh, there's a border conflict right now, you know, uh, regarding um, you know the you know the, the finding of a particular tunnel, you know, between Tijuana and you know in uh, San Diego, uh, San Isidro, or uh, the uh, the shooting of a uh, of an undocumented immigrant on the part of the border patrol, 
And when you, uh, uh, when I think about, you know, uh, my fellow citizens watching um, CNN, or perhaps during the New York Times, then I kind of begin to, to wonder about how then immigration might become a problem at the everyday level uh, regarding, especially how people are thinking about their neighbors, how they're thinking about the immigrants that they see on the streets, and so forth and so on. But, uh, it, so I, it seems to me that we are here today because immigration is contentious, it's a problem to, to key sectors of our society right now. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Um, and even in the most kind of a, a moderate a, a representations of, uh, of the USA re in terms of immigration, you'll find uh, some insights that uh, tell us that uh, uh, how we talk about immigrants uh, right now, it can be problematic, you know, uh, and can affect people um, uh, in, in the school setting, in the, in the workplace. And just let me give you an example. In, uh, in the New York Times on... Uh, January 13, there was an article about how in this October, uh, it says a baby will make, will make 300 million or so. So uh, there, this article in the New York Times deals with how this year our population will be 300 million, okay? And it, has, it, it was uh, written by Sam Roberts, Roberts, who is, I guess, the cultural demographer of the New York Times. And um, very fascinating uh, piece uh, because it, Again, this conversation on, on, on 300 million Americans, but uh, he cannot help but tie it to immigration issues. So in one of the um, uh, paragraphs, I, uh, there's this comment on actually uh, uh, what I think is a, a, what I think it, many people perceive as a problem, which is illegal, so-called illegal immigration. But uh, in this article, he's not speaking to it directly, but nonetheless, let me read to you uh, these uh, uh, lines by him. He says, the symbolic 300 millionth could be an immigrant arriving by plane or crossing the border illegally. But most bets by those who study such things are on a native born baby about 11,000 are born each day. Then he continues, the 300 millionth will be a Mexican Latino in Los Angeles County with parents who speak Spanish at home and with siblings who are bilingual. You know, uh, now, what's interesting here is that I think about the readers of the New York Times who would say, oh, okay, uh, immigrants who uh, arrive by plane or who cross uh, the border illegally. And there's an assumption here that people who arrive in this country by plane, that they're not illegal or undocumented, again. Uh, and uh, so, nonetheless, those who cross the border, you know, uh, are most likely to be illegal because, I don't know, that baby might be an illegal baby, right, the 300 million. And uh, yet, the article actually makes it clear uh, through some um, statistics that uh, in 2004, 12 percent of the population in the USA was foreign-born, foreign-born. 12%. And he reminds us that in 1920, when we were 100 million, the foreign-born population was 13.2%. But then he doesn't comment on the fact that actually, wait a minute, right now we have this debate about immigration and the foreign-born population, that doesn't mean they're undocumented only or you know, it can be an illegal resident and so forth. But there's no commentary on that. And he also does not tell us that between 1830 and 1920, 55 million immigrants came to this country from Europe, mainly from Europe, 55 million, okay? Now, what, is, uh, what I think is important here is that uh, people are not getting all the information as to how really we are not living a problem unless you wanna make it a problem. So uh, there are several uh, political you know, groups like in, you know, in, the, uh, in the Republican uh, control con um, House of Re uh, Representatives uh, where uh, as you have that sheet, you know, you know that they uh, approve of a bill uh, that you know, it's just a manifestation of that kind of a, a problem and threat and anti-immigrant feeling there, which nonetheless, uh, it uh, fits into what people are thinking about their country right now as a problem. 
it's seen as a problem. Yeah. So I just want to close then by uh, actually, you know, at least my answering of this question, and I can elaborate on many things. Uh, because we need to think about why, uh, and I do care about why are so many people in this country thinking that, uh, first of all, that immigration today is a problem, particularly undocumented immigration. Uh, why do they tend to think about undocumented immigrants as, as illegals, therefore criminals? In this, in this bill that was just passed, they officially make anyone who is here in an undocumented manner a criminal. And yet, undocumented people were already criminalized even before this, this bill because they were talked about as illegals. Uh, again, we can talk about what that means. But uh, let me just close with this statement by uh, a person who wrote to the Ch uh, Chicago Tribune. And he says, well, blame Mexico. Blame Mexico. And I think that the last sentence uh, is quite, I think, telling. He says, the human misery that underlies our immigration wars is the direct responsibility of the Mexican government. So uh, I do think that um, the question of as to whether immigration is a problem in, is, is also uh, an issue as to, well, in relation to what governments, how are they dealing with these problems? And uh, right now, uh, it seems to me that uh, the way uh, we, immigration is being addressed, especially undocumented immigration is being addressed today, uh, is being addressed in a very unilateral manner, when in fact it is a bilateral problem that would involve another nation state, in this case, in this case Mexico. So very complex. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Augusto? Yeah. Well, I, I find this uh, uh, presentation of, of immigration as a problem, or immigrants as a problem, uh, interesting because uh, uh, I guess I'm reminded of uh, what W.E.B. Du Bois said in Souls of Black Folk and he's asking, he, he, he's meditating on the question of what is it like to be a Negro problem uh, way back in the early 20th century and I feel uh, uh, hailed by that particular question when I mean, it's framed that immigra immigration and immigrants are a problem because uh, this is a, a, uh, something that's not of an academic issue to me because I'm an immigrant. Uh, I was born in the Philippines, I was raised in the Philippines, I came to this country when I was 10 years old. I, my whole family is, uh, is a family of immigrants and I grew up uh, with immigrants. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this is something that's very important to me. And I think that uh, when we say uh, immigration problem or the immigrants problem, uh, I think that it tends to sort of uh, depersonalize you know, the issue. And we're really talking about people, as, as many of my uh, colleagues here have said, have uh, been a vital part of American life for a very, very long time. Uh, Immigrants really do, in a sense, suffer a major image problem in this country, and I just want to give an illustration of, of some, one particular contradiction of this. When I taught uh, an immigrant uh, America class as a, as a historian, uh, you know, last semester, uh, I did a first day of class, I did a mini survey uh, of, uh, I asked my students, so who do you think, uh, or who do you think about when you think of a famous immigrants you know, in this country, right? You know, who are the most famous immigrants that you could think about? And uh, they thought about it, and they came up with their top two. Their top two uh, was, number two was Albert Einstein, right? And number one was Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> And uh, so I said, okay, all right, so you think about sort of, you know, uh, you know German, Jewish immigrants, uh, uh, you know, Austrian immigrants, and you think about the most famous, right? Uh, most positive, I, I should also say most positive portrayals. And then I asked them, well, when you think about the question of immigration, right, uh, what comes to, you know, to mind? And, uh, immediately you have all of these images of people crossing the border. Uh, the response was, uh, uh, the image was of a brown face, whether it's a man or a woman, especially crossing the border, carrying those bottles of water, crossing the desert, and so on and so forth, risking their lives, uh, or being 
uh, or lowering the wages in the society, you know, all of these things. But immediately it's a very, very uh, starkly contradictory image and a negative image immediately. And uh, I asked my students, you know, maybe you should think about that. Maybe we should think about that, with, you know, this sort of disparity in the way that we view immigrants, you know, in this country. The most positive images that we have are of white male European immigrants, and the most negative images <coughs> that we have immediately are brown uh, men and women uh, crossing the border and contributing nothing, you know, to the, the society. Um, I also feel that uh, in relation to that, that the, the other word that's often used besides the problem is a crisis, mm -hmm. immigration crisis. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I would characterize it that we have issues to deal with in immigration, on the question of immigration or migration in general. But I wouldn't characterize it as a crisis or this problem uh, because any time that you create this notion or conception of a crisis or an emergency, uh, it contributes to, to all of these negative views. Uh, like other metaphors, for instance, like war, uh, that their effect is to mobilize our deepest fears rather, rather than to help us think through what is really a very complicated relationship. Right? Uh, you know, our, our uh, territory with Mexico, Canada, with many other countries, and even our relationship with countries in the Pacific uh, and Atlantic, the Caribbean, are all, in my mind, overlapping with each other. Our, as Edward Said has said, there, we, we live with overlapping territories, uh, interrelated realities and histories. And when we portray these issues and complicated histories in terms of simplistic views of crisis. You know, uh, I think uh, we, we really lose track of all of that uh, complexity. I, I think it's fair to say that the panel doesn't think immigration's a problem. And we'd like to encourage the audience and open this up to a dialogue. Um, and I think that it bears um, some weight to say that I think it's, we should ask the question that people who, don't, who do think it's a problem might ask and have you address it. Um, how would you address, from an economic perspective or a cultural perspective, the, the concern that um, these workers who come over are taking American jobs, helping to keep wages suppressed, um, costing <coughs> localities money. The federal government has, is not forthcoming with money to localities. Children need to be educated. People need health care. How would you address those seemingly real concerns that communities and um, some business people and, and sort of everyday citizens have? Okay. Sure. You want me to start there? Okay. <laughs> uh, being an economist, I think this is uh, uh, probably I should start by is my area. Uh, the concerns, of course, uh, some of it comes from not knowing the full effects of uh, immigration and having these kinds of debates and uh, cool-headed analysis sometimes shows a lot of different effects than one meets the eye initially. Uh, what we know from very careful economic studies is that immigration is beneficial in a huge way to the, for the immigrants, but even for the receiving the host community as a whole, the uh, country as a whole. So that's uh, been established, you know, the main debate is how big that effect is on either side. And for the immigrants themselves, the impact is just absolutely huge. For the host uh, communities, it varies, uh, and it's not as large. The uh, other question is, uh, now, does everybody benefit, or there's some, some who are, might be benefiting more uh, than others, or some uh, localities may be hurt by immigration, others may be gaining. The, the way the benefits come uh, from immigration, for the immigrants, they get higher salaries, wages, better opportunities, etc. Uh, for the uh, receiving communities, 
they get labor at lower wages. Now you might say, oh, gee, that lowers the wages, so the uh, indigenous population or the workers should be, uh, should be hurt. But th that's not uh, the full effect, because you have to take into account that we are both workers and consumers. So if, as workers, our wages may be suppressed, but then we switch and do other things, and then end up consuming the products of uh, immigrants. The same way that trade works. You know, you bring in some product from another country that is produced more cheaply, you produce some other good in which you have competitive advantage, you sell that to the rest of the world, you get, you get the cheap and better quality good from the rest of the world. That, it, immigration does exactly the same thing. And, uh, so when you look at the full effect, almost everybody gains from it. Now, there are uh, fiscal and uh, sort of localized problems sometimes. There's particular parts of the population may be affected or some when uh, in some counties in California you get these low wage workers coming in and producing low cost uh, produce a lot of us consume that and we enjoy it and we don't uh, seem to be bothered by that much but the in the local community if they have to pick up the tap or um, uh, healthcare or other problems that arise because of the way we're managing uh, Im immigration, because of the lack of documentation, lack of proper regulation, etc., then that cost may fall on that local community and then they, they show resentment. Uh, the key issue is how to manage this and make sure they're compensated. In, in light of that, what, did, what is your reaction as an economist to policies like we have in the state of Illinois, where as of October 1st, um, immigrants no longer, no one actually, uh, but it was aimed at immigrants, have to show documentation to buy a house. You no longer need a social security number for a mortgage. You no longer need documentation. Is that a good thing economically or does it create higher risks for um, lending agencies? The uh, uh, risks for the lending agencies, that's their problem. They, they have to, you know, they're credit agencies, they can uh, check and if, they, if somebody's credit is not recorded and they can't trust them, they don't have to lend. I mean, uh, they, so I, they, they take care of themselves. And uh, it, ha reducing uh, restrictions on interaction of, the, uh, of people who want to buy something, buy a house or property, etc. Uh, that should be generally beneficial, uh, basically because you know, we're, we're just removing restrictions that uh, help people who happen to be undocumented. Uh, th this similar problem arises in, in healthcare or other forms of insurance. Uh, they do not get the care that they need or the services that they need, even if they're willing to pay for it because they're not uh, documented. And that hurts a lot of people, not just themselves, their children, other people next to them, you know, it could be uh, a lot of uh, negative if spillover. It, it is interesting that the state of Illinois removed a barrier to how, to buying a home, but not to accessing health insurance. Right, that's, yeah, that, that, those things hopefully with documentation and better uh, proper management could be dealt with. Dorothy? Um, I want to add something here, which is that immigration uh, brings in money. A uh, good way to look at that is to look at cities or metropolitan areas with very low immigration. Um, Baltimore, St. Louis, New Orleans. These are metropolises or former metropolises with very low ra rates of immigration and very, very high poverty rates. Metropolises that used to be doing really badly or were a little bit on the rocks, such as northern New Jersey, Newark area, um, have benefited enormously from uh, immigration, are experiencing a revival. Brooklyn, New York, of course, also Chicago. Um, at the same time, I think it's politically really stupid to say that immigration doesn't cost money. Immigration does cost money. It is just uh, that our political and um, legal structure is such that the costs in this case are borne by communities and maybe states, whereas the benefits are national. Um, I think if we identify this as a problem, a structural and also a political <coughs> problem, then we can focus on the solution that addresses this specific problem. What I find interesting is to look at countries uh, which have a different distribution and redistribution of resources for immigrants, for example, European countries, let's say, 
Denmark, Scandinavian countries, Germany, um, where immigrants also cost money, uh, services are provided, but their national distribution system is a lot better. These countries have a lot of problems with immigrants, but the problems are almost entirely focused on social integration and cultural integration, not on costs. And um, I think, you know, in other words, the problems associated with immigration won't go away if we have a better system, but they would be eased for uh, communities and states um, where the impact is most massive. Do you think that we're better, that this, and this is to all the panelists then, is, do you think that the United States is doing a better job at the social integration and not the economic and service integration, or are they falling short on both? Uh, you know, I... Well. <laughs> Would you rather be an Ethiopian in Denmark or a Mexican in Chicago? Um, I think it's very difficult to compare. You know what I mean? Um, I do think comparative work is hard. Is, yeah, it's is doing a better job, but it's doing a better job by doing not much. In other words, it's such a laissez-faire culture that it reorganizes itself in an informal sense so much more than, um, than European countries that I'm familiar with, and I can't speak about um, Australia, for example. I would like just to comment on, on this question again. If uh, most Americans uh, think that immigrants are people of color. Uh, I'm sorry, are what? That immigrants are people of color from you know, what we gather from right. our students. Uh, then I think uh, we haven't dealt well with the issue of social integration or cultural experience and whether people uh, contribute to the economy or not. Uh, okay, that's one, one question that we, we, as citizens, we need to think about how we deal with each other, uh, and that we need to remind our, our young people that um, immigrants today are going through the experiences that many of their parents and grandparents went through. Uh, in order, again, in that way, when uh, a, a, we measure how uh, workers, whether documented or not, experience the workplace, uh, then I think uh, they, we w I, I would say that, yes, uh, uh, we are working toward that kind of uh, uh, social equality, social justice that I think we claim we, we, are, uh, we want in terms of justice for all kind of thing. So um, it, even, I mean, uh, there's stories, all kinds of stories coming from all over the country about, uh, let's say, uh, Guatemalan immigrants playing soccer in, uh, you know, in, uh, in, the, in the soccer field of an, of an elementary school and being detained for trespassing. You know, in New York, in Virginia, when you have, uh, you know, legislation, local legislation that attempted to uh, regulate and, and, uh, and poorly manage, I would say, again, who lives with, you know, with you in your homes precisely to, to make sure that people who, especially immigrants, who work, uh, who live, uh, you know, in an extended family in a particular apartment, then they can. So uh, we have very serious problems right now in terms of, uh, well, you know, who are the people in power who are, you know, taking these immigrants to, to jail, who are forcing immigrants to think twice about whether uh, they uh, a, are worth, worthwhile human beings. I think that that question of, uh, of race, and everyday life is central to how we understand immigration. And uh, so now, in terms of the economy, even if I tell you that uh, if you look at the service industry, you know, re uh, restaurants and hotels, that the, that sector would not survive without immigrants, documented and undocumented. If I tell you that if you're vegetarian and that everything that you eat, you know, the vegetables that you eat, or you name it, are being collected by immigrants, you know, or if you're a meat lover like I am, you know, and I tell you that the meatpacking industry, you know, has immigrants and that without that, you know, without them you wouldn't survive. Now, uh, so yes, they're contributing to the economy. They are friends of the economy. And, and Fox have told Bush, but Bush knows this, right? But yet he, right now, obviously he's supporting this legislation about the building up of fences. And uh, I know we're gonna get to that question specifically, but what I, what I would like to really emphasize here is that we cannot separate a, what, how we see ourselves as, as citizens, whether uh, as, you know, if you were a Native American or if you were an African American who, you know, through forced migration you came here, or if you're a Puerto Rican who, you know, as U.S. citizens, they're not necessarily immigrants. Nonetheless, nonetheless, of course, we are uh, supposed to be, you know, Americans. And the question is, how do we deal with each other at that level in the workplace, 
in the schools. And I think that that is something that, again, uh, that has to do with management, not only in terms of, of uh, you know, how, where the money goes, but also how we manage our institutions culturally and socially. And we need to think harder at, at again, at, at this one, actually wonderful opportunity that has always been here. I, what I'd like to do is turn to um, Alana and ask, you work on economic uh, integration and assimilation. What are, what are you finding in terms of how well immigrants are being economically integrated? And to, to speak to some of those issues. And again, we'd like to encourage the audience to ask questions. You must have a lot. So um, a couple of thoughts. So I mean, based, so my own research and you know, the research of a lot of other people that work on this. The mic. Side, oh, sorry. Um, is that first in terms of, so there's two questions. One is of occupation and mobility and the other is of earnings. Um, in terms of the economics outcome, economic outcomes, at least that I've looked at and that other people have looked at, um, you know, in terms of occupational mobility, the work that I've done is defi definitely shows, um, you know, about 50% of immigrants experience some kind of downward occupational mobility. This is in the short run. The study that I did was really looking at sort of short-term outcomes, and there's a lot. There's certainly a lot of reason to believe that people experience sort of what they experience in the short term and in the long term is different, and that there's some sh there's some short-term um, shock in terms of downward mobility and then they sort of move up from there. And then in terms of earnings assimilation, there's also a lot of evidence that shows strong rates of earnings growth um, very, pretty quickly. Um, even though immigrants in general, um, there's some very well-known studies that show that immigrants in general um, suffer sort of a deficit when you compare them to a comparable native in terms of earnings for about the first 10 to 15 years that they're here, um, there is there is a catch up. That particular study didn't actually single out, um, didn't single out documented migrants, so it was sort of mixing. But that was, but it's certainly a very well cited study. So there is clearly, you know, the evidence has shown that there is sort of this deficit, but that there's also a lot of growth and that it's quick. Um, the other, just another point that I wanted to make about the original question that was asked about, you know, and I think this is really, I think this question of sort of, you know, do they contribute to, how do immigrants affect the wage structure, and do they contribute to poverty, and do they contribute to unemployment? I mean, these are really the things that people are worried about, and it's sort of like, what is the net effect of an immigrant? Are they sort of taking from the society more than they're getting? And I mean, it, it really is sort of how people feel about it and what the evidence shows. Again, there's somewhat of a disconnect, at least, you know, in sort of what I've seen, um, you know, and what I've read from other people's work. Um, while, you know, more than half of people think that immigrants do contribute to unemployment, the studies that have been done, and to some, you know, this really is an empirical question, and so the studies that have been done really show um, that there's not much of an effect, that immigrants don't have much, either whether it's on the income distribution, whether it's on unemployment, there's all kinds of, you know, empirical sort of methodological problems when you're looking at these questions. But most of those studies have shown if there is an effect, it's minor, and a lot of them show that there's no effect. But yet you still have, you know, I think with the, from the same survey that I looked at, you still have 57% of people, so well over half, who are saying, you know, this again was from 1998, who are saying that it's very likely that immigrants will increase unemployment. Let's move away from unemployment and, and expand the question to, are immigrants in, uh, contributing to increased systemic inequality in the United States. Back to um, Patti's point about um, low, suppressed wages, that is they may have low wages, is the presence of immigrants contributing to that or is it again an, either a, a no gain or a neutral gain? Well, uh, first of all, I just want to say that uh, maybe we could move away to sort of over focusing on immigrants and, and systemic inequality or how they, when I think about inequality in the society, there are a lot of different uh, uh, issues involved in, 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 in you know, in the, on the question of inequality, as racial inequality, class inequality. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, one, one, one thing that I think about especially is when we think about jobs or about uh, you know, the decline in wages, you know, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, let's put it in some kind of context as well. For instance, corporate <coughs> flight overseas, I think, is just about as important, uh, or maybe even of a greater threat to driving down the wages of American workers uh, and to the loss of their jobs as 
many would think immigration would be. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, uh, you know, Stalinese, uh, you know, the so-called so global leader in the chemical industry, uh, just recently, uh, based in here in Illinois, uh, just asked uh, workers to take a 33% wage cut. Uh, those workers who protested that have been locked out. Uh, you know, strike breakers have been brought in. Uh, at the very same time, the CEO of Celanese is making $15 million a year. Uh, and I know you're aware of the fact that Ford uh, has just recently announced that it's going to close five plants in uh, North America, which is going to lead to 35,000 jobs, uh, many of them here in the Midwest, uh, Cleveland and Dearborn among them, uh, you know, being taken away. And, and uh, GM, same thing. There's a PBS uh, program, the news hour last night, basically said uh, that uh, you know the Delphi plant, uh, which supplies General Motors in Flint, Michigan, uh, is uh, you know is asking its workers to take a 50% pay cut, uh, as well as to uh, to accept that they won't have any more pension health uh, well, pension funds or health care, you know, for their workers. And so uh, when we talk about inequality, or systemic inequality, I think uh, it's important to frame things in this sort of larger context of what's happening in the, in the society, in our society at okay. this point. Uh, you know, having said that, I'm not going to say that there's no, uh, you know, uh, question of, of competition or of labor competition that's going on both within the United States and in relation to these factories, you know, closing down relation to uh, other countries overseas, such as China, okay? But I think then we need to ask then what are those, uh, uh, what are the issues that we need to be thinking about in relation to that? Um, let me just throw out a couple of, of things that, that I think, you know, put it on the table. One is that, uh, is the question of, of uh, you know, what's going on in, in overseas, you know, cheap labor, quote unquote, cheap labor in China, for example. I think we need to be talking about the fact that the reason why labor is, quote unquote, cheap in China is not because Chinese workers themselves want it to be that way, uh, but because of the incredibly uh, intolerable conditions of labor in China, uh, you know, from, uh, people not having exactly the same kind of labor rights as here in the United States or in other Western countries, uh, which makes it very, very difficult uh, for, uh, you know, American workers quote, to be able to compete. Uh, and the other thing that I, I'd like to put in on the agenda is the kind of trade policies that we have here in the, in, in the Western countries, uh, you know, that uh, is making life very difficult for uh, for people in places such as Mexico. This, the NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, has uh, contributed especially to the massive influx of maize or corn in Mexico, and it's leading to the widespread uh, eradication of the uh, indigenous people's uh, uh, agricultural industry there. Now, one BBC study said that uh, or, or article said that basically uh, the, that population, a rural population, which is losing much of its livelihood, is in the numbers of 20 million or so. All right, and they're going to be, wh where are they going to be going is the question that you know, many of these BBC, uh, this BBC reports asked. I, I think that's, I th we have someone who's got a question and then maybe we should come back to talk about the systemic ec economic inequality here, but also of the sending nations and what it's doing. Hi, hello, is it on? Should be on. Can you is hear it? me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'm in the um, Department of Urban and Regional Planning and I've been thinking a little bit about this in a slightly different way, so I'm gonna just insert my own agenda if that's okay, and hopefully other people will start asking questions. Um, I'm kind of thinking about this, and when we think about the idea of the problem, is thinking more out like 50 or 100 years, you know, in terms of are we just going to open our borders up? You know, is that a way to deal with it where people can move more freely, or what, how are we going to deal with voting and, and those kinds of issues? And that's been talked about as ways to deal with issues of 
inequality where people live in a place they actually can influence local politics and, and then and move up from there. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if you could comment on that because it seems like we're kind of focusing just on the U.S. and the bounded nation idea whereas possible solutions could be rethinking that idea of citizenship and where people live and have power and so on and so on. I think, I think a comment on that is warranted, but we should say that we, we talked about making this a broader than U.S. Uh, discussion and decided to be more U.S. focused simply because we've got to put some boundaries on it or we could be here till tomorrow morning or next week. So that was the decision, but I think that some addressing of the comparative issue is very important. And great. I just... May. Okay, why don't you two handle that? <laughs> okay. Um, the mic. I, I'm very interested in, um, in, a, uh, in maintaining a national focus in this case. Not that I'm a rabbit nationalist, but the bills that are in front of us, um, which, I, which is just a temporary summary that I put together, and, and the whole thing might look somewhat different, although probably not less scary in the last um, analysis, in, in a couple of months, is a nationalist manifesto by uh, certain forces, majorities in Congress. And I think um, we can talk about all about um, the world and the freedom of people and transnational citizens, all we want. But Representative Sensenbrenner in the middle of this country in Wisconsin sits around and this is what he comes up with a wall around the United States, criminalization of any agency or person who helps immigrants come, um, it possibly illegally, uh, local law enforcement being trained, financed, and empowered to be uh, immigration agents and apprehending people might be here illegally. Those are massive changes to who we are as a nation, in my opinion, and I think it's very important that we focus on uh, issues that are related. Citizenship, I didn't even mention it because it was voted down here, but essentially an amendment to eliminate birthright citizenship, that is, break the 14th Amendment, for U.S.-born children of undocumented workers. This, uh, I, I, mean, I can't think of a much more massive um, a question mark to what defines us constitutionally. Um, as citizens of this country. And we can, you know, say, we'll do away with this, and it's not that important, and the future is transnational. But I do think Congress is not. And uh, we gotta come up with an answer, I think, as individuals and as a community of uh, people here, as university people. I think that's very important in relation to the question of what's gonna happen in the future. What is decided by the United States Congress today is going to impact four or five generations, and it is going to impact how other nations, especially European nations, begin to deal with immigration because th we seem to play off of each other. So, thank you. Yeah, you know, I would like to connect these two points. Um, the, the, the problem with the inequality in terms of wages, as Augusto mentioned, I mean, it's part, it's related to the global economy. And uh, at the everyday level, again, I would like to remind you because, you know, uh, Sorensen in Wisconsin, he has, he might be responding to his constituents who are very concerned about these immigrants, you know, in their, in their towns, in their churches and so forth, you know. In Wisconsin? And, well, no, Sorensen. Yeah, I mean, but, that, but there's no, no evidence of but that. But there, you know, my, my point, let me make my point, which is, I think, is really vital in terms of, uh, and I want to make a case that is vital. Look, when people uh, in the 70s and 80s were concerned about losing their jobs because they were going to Mexico, you know, and now to China, okay, they were already very, you know, a lot of the people that work in classes, and I think when you, when you ask the question, you know, inequality in, in immigration, uh, let's, I, I assume that we're talking about the working classes, you know, that not necessarily about the middle class immigrants or upper class immigrants. Uh, not that, you know, again, that, that, is, that they're not important, but, and they are, but if we think about the working classes in the U.S. and globally, you know, it's very clear to me that historically, a lot of the people in Tennessee were very, very unhappy with Mexico and Mexicans because their jobs were, were going there. Now, right now, because of NAFTA and, you know, the disposition of peasants and the uh, underpaid uh, work in the, in the maquiladoras, 
people, you know, and, and all kinds of factors, the violence that comes with the, you know, trafficking and so forth. But now you had the people that they were afraid of, who were taking their jobs in the factories in Mexico and, you know, in Central America and other places. Now they're in their churches, they're in their hometowns. And again, I think that kind of global citizenship, which again, we need to address as citizens, and I wish that our government would incorporate those issues into, again, our understanding of everyday life and, 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 and so forth. So um, I, I agree with uh, Dorothy that uh, what, now this legislation is a, a reaction to those moments, to that, that kind of globalization, mm -hmm. and which again is dividing the working classes in that sense. I mean, right? Uh, right. You know, these are the, uh, you know, uh, so I just wanted to make that point that, yes, the global economy matters tremendously. And before we can think about the next 50 years or the next 20 years, we need to understand, again, our immediate history, but also mm -hmm. how I do think that uh, the people who are very afraid of, of immigrants, who are ha immigrants of color, uh, many of them, is so how you come from, you know, and again, a lot of these immigrants, uh, as you know, who come through Mexico are coming from Brazil, they're coming from China and so forth, and there's, uh, it, now, all of these countries, to many Americans who see themselves as white, and maybe Americans should be only white, uh, it's like, oh my God, you have these people here now. And we need to then, I, I do, in the, so we need them to create these fences, so I do think that all of this is, con is connected. Uh, but I, and I agree, though, that we need to have a, a solid understanding of the U.S. experience in this global context without having to sh sh shift uh, uh, our focus. Okay. Yes. Um, I think there's one other dimension which I think uh, captures the spirit of this new bill that's proposed, and that's the dimension of security. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's because a lot of you have pointed out very clearly that a lot of the circumstances and the issues involved have been around for a very long time. I suspect that there's been a pervasive general hostility to immigrants almost in every country of the world and almost all of the time. And I think also that um, businesses and the corporate elite say what else you might want about them have always perceived that, they're, that the economic realities are a little different from popular prejudice and have always, so you have a divide, you have a cleft between what the business elite would like and what popular culture would like. And the problem is that right now that's exacerbated because um, the corporations try to find a way around the popular world by allowing illegal immigration or even facilitating it. And right now, people are very upset about the idea that people are crossing the border, either undetected or unregulated, and their attitude is, why should we be sympathetic to a group of people, be they 12 people or 12 million people, who break the law, right? That just doesn't, people don't feel safe if somebody can enter their own home, right, without knocking, and I think, and without being let in. And I think the image that's being transported to the American, by the means of the propaganda and the campaigns right now is that these immigrants are coming into our country, we don't know who they are, and we don't know what they'll do to us. And under that set, I think that concern with security has to be addressed. It's, a, it's a, maybe a ridiculous exaggeration, but this is, this is how people are being, this is the discourse, this is how people are being addressed. And that's something that has to be addressed, otherwise one's missing the point of this bill. I, I think that's, that's a really important point. Alana? question of security, it's, it's interesting, and I think that, um, I think that in terms of, you know, in the 90s there was, you know, a, a large increase in the, um, in the amount of money and, and, and hours that were put into border enforcement um, in the, on the Mexico border, and what, what people have, what research since then has shown is that it really didn't, it decreased the probability of, appreh of apprehension, it didn't decrease the probability of people, it increased the cost for Mexicans, the cost of paying a coyote to come. It didn't um, do any, it didn't, it decreased the probability of apprehension, it also decreased the probability that the people, that the migrant workers would actually return home because they made it so hard to come that they, it lowered the probability that they'd return. And the other thing that it did is it increased the mortality rate. So you had, because people were sort of looking for more remote ways to cross, so it was really this like phenomenal sort of, by a lot of ways, sort of just big waste of money that sort of ended up, you know, with a lot of people being killed. Um, and you ended up having a lot of people who would probably otherwise have just been target earners or sort of cyclical migrants who ended up staying. So, you know, the signs point to this, you know, this increased enforcement and sort of militarization of the border is not, is not really the way to go. 
Yeah, I thank you so much for you know your your point. I, I really you know we're in a post 9/11 world, right? And that has allowed for all kind of opportunists to make all kinds of claims as to our dangers. Yes, we cannot deny that you know it's a different moment. Security matters for all sovereign nations. But you know when you look at I, I've looked at the border inspections through time, and even before 9/11. A lot of people were dying already throughout the 90s. Okay, there were different uh, legislations that you know, state legislations that were actually implemented, the uh, Operation Blockade in 1993 and so forth, that uh, just forced people to instead of again crossing the border as they were doing, they were actually having they had they had to go to different des desert zones. Obviously, by now, 10 years later, uh, you 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 know about these deaths that are taking place, and uh, the. Uh, so that is a reality, and both governments have to address this. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I just have to tell you that you have to think twice about what you believe in, in terms of, is it really true, let's say, that, uh, the, uh, there's been a, that the borders have been more uh, porous, or that they, people are just running across the border like, like, you know, like you see on CNN. Is that really true? To what extent can we really document that? Let me just tell you that you know, even in, in 2004, uh, out of the seven million supposedly undocumented immigrants in this country, the, the Homeland Security actual department noted this. One third of those who were here illegally had just simply overstayed their visas. Mm -hmm. They did not cross that river, that uh, fence. You know, okay, that's really important. Now, when you look at the people who are actually mobilizing across the Southwest, you have to think about who are they. If you notice, they actually escalated the management project, you know, several of the people who are very seriously concerned about safety. You know, I, I but think, let, me, let me finish. Okay. Let me I was going to go to Professor Estefan. No, I, go I just need to make this point. Okay. Before they voted for this in the, in, in, how, in the House, before, about a month before that, these groups mobilized in such a way that they were actually, you know, surveilling the border. So it made, it, it made news. Bush was there and Shurtoff was there. And it sounded like, oh, my God. And then so the media began to pay more attention to it. So that the, the constituents around the country are the people who are in Congress. Again, they're more, be more sensitive to that, and the legislation is going to pass. If you notice, that the three incidents that have occurred uh, at the U.S.-Mexico border regarding, uh, you know, these uh, actually uh, um, shootings, you know, on both sides. And it's a very difficult, actually, uh, case. But I just want to tell you uh, that right now, February is coming up. So the Senate is going to, you know, discuss this issue. Pay attention to the media. And, uh, you know, Arizona came up with a fact, of course, supposedly with the facts, that the crime had increased because of these undocumented uh, crossings, you know, in Arizona. And anyway, so I just want to tell you not to deny, but to, to think twice about, uh, and also look, the terrorists might come across. So I do think that there are people in this country today who do not, want, who do not feel as comfortable with people of color, okay? And they would still, some of them still fear difference in that way. You know, now, as you know, the Minutemen Project, they were actually tied to some, some uh, neo-Nazi groups, and then they tried to deny that. My point is that, uh, the post 9-11 moment, okay, can serve as, as, as an opportunity to make all kinds of claims, not to deny again the danger and the difficulty of the issues. I, I'd like to turn to, to Hadi Asafani, but let's, the one point you did make that I think is really important that we have not emphasized perhaps as much as we should have. When we talk about illegal immigrants, undocumented immigrants in this country, it is not Mexican Americans. They are from every nation where you have immigrants. And when you have people overstaying their visas, it is not just South Americans, Central Americans, and Mexicans who are doing that. And I think that that's a really important uh, point. And I thank you for emphasizing that with the data. Hadi? Um, uh, thank you. And I just want to add that I happen to know quite a few of my classmates, etc fellow citizens who came here, overstayed their visa, had trouble with immigration, and now are, have settled uh, very productive professionals. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I think the issue, this issue of security and uh, illegality, etc., uh, this is uh, very important. But uh, 
one, one key issue or uh, things that we need to separate is that is immigration, uh, how is it immigration affecting uh, U.S. Uh, society, other societies, the world economy, etc.? The other issue is uh, whether immigrants being legal or illegal makes a difference. I think illegality it hurts the immigrants themselves in a big way because you know they can't uh, benefit from what this society has to offer from opportunities here and it creates troubles for themselves, creates insecure security problems, etc. So, <coughs> yes. That has to be addressed, and uh, for example, guest worker pro uh, programs are an alternative being proposed. The difficulty is that a lot of these programs uh, have, uh, are difficult to manage, and sometimes they end up with loopholes, etc., that uh, defeats the purpose. Uh, so the question is that, uh, the issue is that we don't have a perfect solution, and we have to weigh different solutions against each other. Um, and, and that leads in, and I'd like to start with Professor Espiritu on this, this leads in to what I think, based on discussions that the panel has had prior to today, to one of the most central questions. And that is, what ought we propose or can we propose um, in terms of policy to reconcile the need that Dorothe has hinted at and talked about a couple of times, that is the need to maintain sovereignty over our borders and the human rights of individuals who seek to come and stay here. And again, Professor Asafani's last point is to make sure that it's, it's also not hurting the immigrants. And if we could start with you, Augusto, to address that, that would be very helpful. Uh, I guess I, as I... Uh before I, I just, sure. uh, if I could just address this question of insecurity, uh, uh, I think that the question of security is important as is the question of sovereignty. Uh, and definitely nations are entitled, you know, to be able to control their own borders. And in our case, we do. <coughs> I mean, we do attempt to do that and exercise that, that sovereignty in order to be able to, for people to feel more secure. I think the question of security to me, though, brings, the, uh, brings, uh, brings to mind uh, the question of uh, uh, insecurity. What is making people insecure? Uh, I think we need to address that question. Uh, and, uh, you know, is it, is it uh, uh, on the one hand, I think, for instance, uh, like, uh, is drugs, you know, is there these tunnels that are, uh, that people are, that, that have just been found? Is that what, is that what, making people insecure. Okay, then that needs to be addressed from a law enforcement standpoint. But let's not lose track of, of, of the side of the fact of where that demand for drugs is coming from. That we need to address that question here in the United States. Uh, if if there, the drug war, as it's been carried out, has been a war on neighborhoods, uh, particularly inner city communities. But what about what's going on in Beverly Hills or in uh, you know, or in, in other affluent communities where these kind of cocaine demands are coming from. That's contributing to the insecurity that we have, particularly on that, on that question. And, and I think there's also, uh, it's also important to, to understand or to take into account the historical reality of our relationship, you know, between uh, the United States and all of these uh, countries where most immigrants are coming from, especially today, which are our former colonies, especially our or the, the product of American <coughs> conquest, that uh, you know, there are very, very important issues. I mean, if we think that, that uh, uh, you know, the, the, for some, some, in some sort of perverse way, you know, all of these millions of immigrants that are crossing the border are equated with being terrorists. I mean, the, the image is, you know, of, of terror, you know, is, uh, you know, become, they become essentialized, that, that, that is their, Character, you know, these two are being, uh, you know, fused in a very perverse way. I think uh, when all we need to do is look at all of the different situations in which migration issues are going on around the world. Uh, whether you you talk uh, about uh, Mexicans coming to the United States, or uh, you know, uh, I was in Puerto Rico last night. The, the Dominicans going to Puerto Rico, uh, Africans trying to cross into Spain. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Arab immigrants uh, going to France or Germany, 
uh, or Filipino migrants going into uh, Japan and the Middle East. You know, this question is not, it, it's a fundamental misstatement of the problem to say that migration is about uh, a terror and should lead to this insecurity. I think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, it really points to the, the lack of understanding of why people migrate, you know, in the first place and the kind of, of uh, uh, difficult international globalized uh, situation we find ourselves in and the, and the, uh, the drastic effects that these have had on the livelihoods of, of various developing nations uh, you know, all over the world. Uh, so uh, you know, the, the solutions that I would advocate for this, I think one is definitely to take into account and as a historian, I'm probably the least equipped to be able to deal with these kinds of specific proposals, but, uh, it, but I, I would say that the perspective of immigration has to become much more globalized. We need to think about the, the specific histories uh, along the, the U.S.-Mexico border as well as in our relationship with other uh, Asian countries. Uh, uh, we need to think about uh, overall helping to improve the, uh, the question of, uh, or the, the situation of workers all over the world, the, in support unionization or la the uh, human rights of laborers all over the world. If we want to see any kind of improvement in the situation here in this country uh, for workers' wages or, or uh, employment, we need to, uh, to look at that as well as unfair trade policies uh, and foster uh, the human rights you know, of, of workers and of migrants. Uh, to this day, I mean, the, there is an international convention on migration that very, very few countries, and this country has not ratified, and there are about 27 countries who have ratified this since it got started in 2000, uh, 2002, I believe, that attempt to provide basic protections for migrants all over the world. The United States and uh, most Western countries are not part of that. We don't see uh, uh, this question apparently in any sort of uh, global uh, way or as a condition of human beings throughout the world. But I think that that as well as other globalized solutions is what we, where we need to go. Dorothy? Um, I uh, want to uh, reaffirm the idea that um, uh, a better regulation of uh, of immigration uh, is necessary in order to reaffirm um, our um, idea that as a nation we have something to say about this. I want to draw your attention to the fact that about one million people um, become legal permanent residents, that is, um, immigrants. Every year uh, the uh, figure uh, goes up and down some between 650,000 and 1.2 million in the last 10 years. Um, the majority of these, uh, about 60% uh, are so-called adjusters. That is, those are people who have been in this country, often have been working, sometimes have been students, um, sometimes uh, here as visitors, uh, and then be, they become legal permanent residents. Okay, so a majority of people who become legal permanent residents are already here. <coughs> um, of uh, those people who become legal permanent residents, the majority uh, gains that right because they have close family members here, or they, for example, get married, um, or um, they uh, are here already and the uh, mother or father sponsors them. A minority of about 35% um, gains the right to be an immigrant because of their occupational professional qualifications. It's a minority. Um, immigration policy has, uh, and, and people who are interested in this have discussed whether this is the proper proportion and especially restrictionist forces are in favor of restricting family migration in favor of professional migration. Um, countries such as Canada, Australia favor a higher percentage of professionals and make it a little more difficult for family migration. But I think that is pushing the envelope. I don't think that's a practical thing to do in the context of who immigrants are and what, their, um, what kind of social context um, they live in and settle in and come from. Uh, so I don't think tinkering with these proportions uh, works. Tinkering with the numbers uh, might. One point, um, I think up, up to 1.5 million became legal permanent residents in the wake of the amnesty program of 1986. 
took a while to work. But then in the mid-90s, that was the case. Um, is that something we should do? Should we, uh, we know <coughs> that if you are um, the brother or uh, sister of a Filipino legal permanent resident or a citizen um, in this country, uh, you have to wait, they sponsor you, you have to wait how many years to gain entry? You have to stand in line, 22 years, okay? You have to wait 22 years. Um, that's not functional, that, that doesn't work. It, you can't, you can't wait for 22 years. Um, others are 15 year uh, waiting periods. So uh, that's just tinkering with the system, I understand. But to have a functioning immigration bureaucracy would also be a vast innovation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, the system Dorothy, is, just, just to interject, the right. one visa <laughs> that is supposed to address emergent economic needs, mm -hmm. the EB, the employment-based visa, mm -hmm. quick as you can get through. These are emerging, necessary situations. Mm -hmm. Two years. Two years. Two years. And that, that's, what we're de that's yeah. how we deal with the so-called labor crisis. Right. I'm, I'm, I was just interested in finding out um, how many people work on behalf of these immigrants or would-be immigrants. We know a million people, right? Plus, um, if we're not citizens, we are under the supervision of, of, um, of that bureaucracy. So um, we're talking easily um, 10 million people, 20 million people at any given time. How many people uh, are paid by the federal government to take care of, um, of immigration services? 1,100 people nationwide. 1,100 people. That's incredible. That's not a functioning system, right, compared to, say, the Pentagon and the 500,000 people in the armed forces the Pentagon takes care of. Um, so uh, I think this would actually be a vast shift if we addressed these uh, in, uh, inadequacies and bureaucratic problems. It would be a shift in priorities. It would take a strong political will, and it would take um, fessing up to um, the fact that there are very large uh, interests in our, uh, in our country that are in favor of a dysfunctional system because it provides cheap labor, um, a, a dangerous and, and, and um, very limited status of, of living here, etc. Anybody else care to address the question of what we ought to do? Well, I just would like to say that, look, uh, if you notice, um, Understanding different quotas, how different, how long it takes to become a citizen or to become a, a permanent resident. Yes, it's really interesting that uh, in the 19th century, you know, Europeans could come here as aliens, and then if they denied uh, their citizen, you know, their their loyalty to their country, then they could become citizens. And of course, that that the, the history was not homogeneous. Different groups dealt with different, you know, struggles. But if you think about what people have to go through today. You know, in fact, the discourse on the newspapers about oh, these immigrants becoming citizens of once we allow them to be here, it's like, oh my God, they're going to they're gonna become American citizens right away. Where there's all these, kind, all these levels of inspections and, you know, and timing that they, they, have, they have to go through. Uh, I just think that uh, it's fundamental that we understand we as citizens, our policymakers, again, really who we are as, as, as U.S. citizens. Uh, how did we get where we are? And we'll see that the people today who fear immigration you know, uh, yes, the need, management needs to be there, you know. Uh, then we'll see that uh, really, uh, the, I hardly agree with actually, you know, Dean, um, uh, the, um, from the Democratic Party, and, uh, you know, he gets out of control, Howard Dean, once in a while. But he makes a very important point, like, these are human beings who want, you know, who actually want a better life, just like everybody. And uh, of course, I tend to go back to the, import, the, the, the issue of undocumented people because I do think that that is what is creating the problem today. Okay, not because I believe that those are the only things that matter. And I just want to say that in, in policy, the way we talk about immigrants, even today, you know, there's a very important book about, you know, that, uh, that talks about invisible immigrants. And these were invisible Im the European immigrants who, because they were white, they were invisible as immigrants. And we have to think that they are also invisible because they are also undocumented, many of those, you know, European. So, uh, again, the examples as to, yes, Central America, Brazil, China, that, that helps. But we also need to go back, look at, at, at Europe also as a place that we're still dealing with. So, again, bilateral uh, uh, policy is really, really important. Because sometimes this, you know, this country, this uh, administration 
would prioritize a particular nation more than the other. So I do think that for policy, uh, bilateral conversations still matter while retaining, of course, the needs of the U.S. Okay. And uh, I think that the, you know, not everybody who is Republican, of course, is against immigration. And I just want to make it clear, and I think you make it clear here to Dorothy, that uh, there are several moderate Republicans who have, of course, businessmen who, would, who want to benefit from this legislation. But I do think that uh, what McCain and Kennedy are proposing uh, makes, I think, sense to the extent that, you know, it's more realistic that, no, that we, we cannot really uh, send everybody uh, uh, back to their country uh, and so forth. And I, so I think that there is some uh, uh, logical, commonsensical uh, policy that I hope is going to be addressed in February. But I am concerned about, again, what happens in the media and how then, uh, because look, we never thought that we were going to attack Iraq. I mean, really, we, we, I mean, we did, if you look at the administration, they were already focused on that. It didn't make sense, right? There were all the elements there. I think people are wondering today, what, what, are we going to build a, a wall you know, along the Mexico-US border? And we think, no, that's stupid. You know, we cannot, it's ridiculous to think that. Well, we don't know. I think as Americans, we voted you know, our prejudices, as Augusto is saying, and not our, our right. So be careful, and that's really what I really want. And I also think it's important to note that if you look at the Senate bill that comes up for debate that is being referenced here, yes, it is primarily a Republican written bill, but if you look at the major co-sponsors, you have people like Ted Kennedy co-sponsoring the bill. So this is not, this notion of how to deal with immigration does not easily fall along liberal conservative continuums or party lines. And that's, that, that I think is an indicator of just how difficult and complex a policy and economic question immigration really is. Did you? I uh, wanted to uh, make uh, three quick points. One was actually pick up again and emphasize what Ilana uh, pointed, pointed out, that we don't uh, have a very clear a definition of what the goal of immigration policy is. Uh, there has been some uh, ideas from the past that formed uh, immigration policy. Times have changed, but there, there doesn't seem to be a very clear debate there and, and a sort of uh, active debate of what do we want to achieve uh, with immigration policy. The second one is that uh, we, the proposals that are uh, being uh, proposed and debated, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of this public discussion about uh, what we know um, more from careful statistical studies and sociological studies, et cetera, of what immigrants do, what happens. And that lack of knowledge seems to be causing a lot of tension and a lot of uh, problems. And, uh, uh, People, and, and that's reflected in uh, the divergence one sees in uh, careful studies and public opinions. It's just uh, two different things. And the last thing I wanted to say is that um, any solution that we think about will have some problems. Once we define our goals, once we uh, look at uh, careful studies and design a policy, there's going to be some problems in achieving those goals. We just have to accept that, that there, these things are not going to be perfect and try to find the kind of policy that does best rather than trying to find a perfect solution or, or think that if you have that high wall and high tech stuff, uh, we're going to keep everybody out and uh, forget that people are going to find some way of uh, <laughs> bypassing those, those things one way or the other. I, I think that is a very nice note to end on. And on behalf of the Center for Advanced Study, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and to especially thank our panel very much. And <laughs> <laughs>